the guard ended up putting black citizens in an internment camp and would only release anyone if a white employer could vouch for them. Yeah. And these released black folks were marked with green tags. Now, the Nazis Jeez. heard about this and they were like, well, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Boy, yeah. these Americans, they really, they're good. They're good with ideas is what they are. We should really be paying attention. Stars to Stars would be fun. <laughs> stars, Let's yeah. do stars, Klaus. <laughs> yeah. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, you guys might notice that uh, you, you, you hear a little bit of laughter in the background of these, uh, of these videos, of the Forkful of Noodles videos, and that's because these videos were recorded in front of a live virtual audience. That's right. I perform these, these shows over Zoom in front of a virtual audience that uh, laughs and participates through the show and it's a really fun time and if you uh, want to be a part of that show you totally can you can go to my website krishmohanhaha.com and snag tickets for these shows i do them once a month on the last friday of every month at 8 p.m eastern at 5 p.m pacific they're ten dollars but if ten dollars is a little bit too much if you're struggling financially and you still want to come check out this show that's not a problem uh, reach out to me, send me an email, DM me on Twitter, send me a message on Facebook, various different ways you can communicate with me. Let me know that you want to check out the show and, and you've hit some financial hard times, and I will get you a free code for the show so you can come, hang out, enjoy a, 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 a comedy show that addresses issues that you won't hear on corporate mainstream media, uh, and, and, and be around some like-minded, wonderful people. Uh, so again, if you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, you can snag your tickets and join the live virtual comedy shows that happen every single month. Thank you guys so much and enjoy this video. Hello, everybody. Uh, so a quick little announcement before we get into the uh, the episode about the Tulsa race massacre. I apologize for uh, a little extra preamble, but um, so the first five minutes are going to be in this format where it's not recorded in front of a live virtual audience. And the reason for that is during the show, um, there was a little bit of an audio glitch and I spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to get rid of the audio glitch. It was basically some feedback from somebody's microphone and um, I, I, tr I spent a, a long time trying to figure out how to fix that, but unfortunately, I was not able to fix it. I don't have an audio engineer. Um, I don't have a, a producer on the show. It's all kind of run through me and the audience that takes part in the show. So the audience is the one that's like, hey, we're hearing some feedback. We got to get rid of it. Um, and, and they did call it out, but unfortunately, it, it, it took them a little while. So... Uh, the first ne first few minutes of the show, the first few minutes of this episode are going to be in this format where you're not really going to hear some la laughter, and then I will transition it into uh, the virtual show. Now again, if you would like to, if you'd like to help me get to the point where I can uh, pay a producer, pay an audio engineer and a video engineer uh, to help me with these videos, you can, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. Uh, those, those will, those will help out quite a bit. Uh, so, uh, without any further ado, let's dive into this week's episode. Human rights. It's one of the justifications that America uses to launch wars and xenophobically attack cultures and races. It's why we hate the likes of China and Russia and terror groups with vaguely Middle Eastern names and people that like Christmas, people that dislike Christmas and continue to condemn socialism. Now, the question is, does America have the moral high ground to be judge, jury and executioner when it comes to human rights violations? The answer is no. The end. Good night, everybody. That's the show. Let's all go home. 
No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm of course kidding. But and and look, all right. Before everybody starts freaking out and telling me that, well, if you don't like it here, you can just go back to your own country. Uh, thank you for approving my point about xenophobia. But I do have proof that America has no legs to stand on when it comes to human rights violations. And before we do, can I just address that ludicrous statement real quick? Right? Anytime someone tells me to go back to my own country, I usually say, you first, pilgrim. And when they shake off the confusion of hearing a brown man quote John Wayne, America's manliest man that's ever manned a manhood, I remind them that Americans are descendants of immigrants who brutally stole this land from the indigenous. This country technically belongs to the indigenous people who lived and worked with the land rather than on it using slave labor. And that's where this particular story of America's human rights violations really begins. The Tulsa Race Massacre is connected to the passage of the Dawes Act, which gave the American government the right to divide native lands. Good. I mean, I was getting real worried that we'd never make Manifest Destiny into a law, but finally, somebody has done it. Right? But this did allow newly freed black people to get their promised 40 acres of land. Between 1865 and 1920, Oklahoma had the largest population of black people in the country. And Oklahoma wouldn't be a state without black people. They were the railroad workers, cowboys, and sharecroppers that built the foundation of the state. Actually, come to think of it, most states wouldn't be a state without the help of black people. Several black entrepreneurs helped the community of Greenwood, aka Black Wall Street, in North Tulsa flourish. O.W. Gurley built a boarding house for black Americans. Gurley would often loan money to black Americans who would use it to start a business in the Greenwood district. He would help these businesses grow and expand so that people could enjoy what the business had to offer. Which, I mean... <laughs> What a mook, am I right? I mean, you don't loan people money to help their business grow. You you loan people money so that they are indebted to you and you can exploit them for the sake of capitalism. Clearly, Gurley didn't get it. Despite that thought, though, Greenwood did become one of the most successful areas in all of Tulsa. J.B. Stanford, a former slave turned into a lawyer and activist, believed that black people need to pull their resources together and uplift their communities. And look, this was a very dangerous thought because it does sound like a commie pinko Russia Putin traitor talk. In capitalism, the only pool you need to worry about is the in-ground one built by exploiting the working class. But the successes of Greenwood came exactly because of that. One dollar would circulate through the community of Greenwood anywhere from 19 to 100 times before it was spent on a white-owned business outside Greenwood. And for the kids to understand, that would be like keeping your Venmos in the community for a fortnight. Hashtag YOLO, am I right? Huh? You guys get it, right? Um, is, it, is this cool? Am I cool? Is this cool? Are, you, are the kids getting it? Greenwood also had its own school system with a better education than the white schools. There was a business college, banks, two theaters, salons, nightclubs, hotels, and even a functioning public transportation system. There are towns in America right now that don't have a decent bus system, Pittsburgh, uh, <laughs> and in towns that do, People don't use the transportation because the bus smells weird. Well, maybe if we had a funded, actual funded public transportation system, more buses, trains, and trams would have better ventilation and maybe even a bathroom. Right? I, I think we have a very backwards way of dealing with transportation in this country. Right? I think cars should be used for long-distance travel, but 
If you're moving within a city, public transportation should be readily available and better funded. And they and they probably wouldn't smell as bad either if they were funded well. Wouldn't be a problem. Now, Greenwood even had its own newspaper called the Tulsa Star. This was founded by A.J. Smitherman, and it educated the citizens of Greenwood about their rights and would often cover pieces of legislation that are either beneficial or harmful to black Tulsans. They cover stories that involved things like Oklahoma's first piece of legislation, which involved instating segregation into the state. Ah, yes, the fun things of signing discrimination into law, just like a democracy should, right? <laughs> yeah, gotta do it by the rules. <laughs> after the Constitutional Congress, after the state it was approved, the first bill, the first bill segregated the state. Despite this bill by the new government, blacks remained in Oklahoma, living in both all black towns and Oklahoma's cities. One of those cities was Tulsa. You know that bill is evil because of that music. Very sinister music. This legislation segregated Tulsa into a black north and a white south because you don't want to mess with classic racism, right? You know? <laughs> Much like new coke, new racism is going to be weird and will it will make you gassy. <laughs> and again... What a mook, right? H.H. Smitherman trying to teach people about legislation that is going to be beneficial or harmful to them. Okay, look, newspapers are not supposed to do that. They're supposed to tell you which billionaire to fawn over, right? How, how Russia is bad and where the hottest sales are happening, right? The, the Tulsa Star didn't even have any commercials, and they didn't try to justify any wars either. It's, it's like they don't even get what corporate journalism is supposed to be about, you know? Where is the propaganda? You're, you're just educating the plebes, you fool. It's ridiculous. Now, the Tulsa Star also advocated for an armed black populace and taught folks how to protect themselves, which is, like, weird because wow. it's, yeah, it's almost like they understand the responsibility of owning a firearm and what well-regulated means, you know? I bet, I bet the, the Tulsa Star understood comma placement, unlike the Second Amendment, who used commas like a first grader who just discovered what punctuations were. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty fucked up amendment, you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, one might think that the paper was being alarmist, but this was the early 1900s when the Ku Klux Klan was still powerful and very violent partly because the Republican Party had shifted its views on the KKK. The party went from demonizing the Klan and hunting them out of communities to be friendly with them after McKinley turned the GOP into the party of big business and bosses. Now, Greenwood's successes had caught the ire of the white communities, right? Most of these white folks were low to middle class, uh, middle, middle class working people that were working in the booming oil industry at that time. The economic solidarity of Greenwood was a threat to white bosses who were using racism as a way to keep their wealth intact. I mean, this is classic capitalism, right? It, which is a little different from new capitalism, which is basically the exact same thing as classic capitalism, but like in a new suit and slightly more gassy. But this is a classic method of exploitation right to convince white workers the reason they're poor isn't the greed of the bosses but rather the black men and women who hoard their rightful wealth <laughs> it's the dangerous mix of racism manifest destiny and white supremacy that is still used to this day yeah this is the origin of the immigrant stole my jobs myth so <laughs> White Tulsans were basically looking for any excuse to attack the thriving black community of Greenwood. And they found that excuse in Dick Rowland in 1921. Now, a good amount of Greenwood residents had to work in the greater Tulsa area and were in the oil business. But there were some who were inspired by the entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit of Greenwood and started their own smaller enterprises. 
Dick Rowland was a 19-year-old shoe shiner in Tulsa and made a pretty decent wage as one. And because of segregation, there was only one black bathroom in the city. It was in the Dexter building. And when Dick Rowland entered the building and got on the elevator with the operator, a white woman named Sarah Page, residents claim they heard Sarah scream and Dick Rowland run away. Now, Rowland is arrested for potential sexual assault and is kept in prison. To this day, nobody knows exactly what happened in that elevator. The most likely explanation is that Roland tripped and fell into Sarah Page, call causing her to scream in shock. But the Tulsa Tribune decided to run a very different story. The Tulsa Tribune ran a story titled Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in Elevator. This inflammatory article strongly implies that Dick Rowland, a black man, had raped the young white elevator operator, Sarah Page. 3.15 p.m., the newspaper hits the streets of Tulsa. Now these guys get what journalism is about, huh? You know? Uh, I... You just, you just kind of print whatever the fuck you want, and then the proof comes later. Or it doesn't. Who cares, right? We move that paper, baby. That's what it's about. It's all about them subs. You know what I'm talking about? That's what these guys are doing. Sidebar, uh, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe this stuff. Uh, very, <laughs> very important. Also... I gotta say, this kind of makes Tulsa Tribune America's very first tabloid, right? The next story they ran was about Woodrow Wilson's underwear mm -hmm. and whether Bigfoot is real or not. Uh, mm -hmm. sp spoiler alert, he is not. Probably. Aww. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, I don't you know. You don't I, mean that, Chris did, Mohan. Did, you I don't research. mean that. It's a comedy <laughs> show and that's a joke. Dream crusher. <laughs> That's the most controversial statement I'll make. Like people will be, <laughs> people will leave comments about their proofs of Bigfoot. <laughs> but they're uh, back, back to Tulsa. Uh, as a mob of white Tulsa started surrounding the sheriff's department, Sheriff William McCullough and his men barricaded the sheriff's office and were assisted by anywhere from twenty-five to seventy-five armed black men from Greenwood. Most of these black men were World War I veterans. After a white Tulsan tried to take a black Tulsan's gun away, a shot is fired, which erupts the race riot. Overwhelmed by the number of white folks, the black folks retreated back to Greenwood to try and regroup. The lynch mob of angry white folks, who were now deputized by city officials and the Tulsa police, charged into Greenwood and proceeded to destroy the town and kill anyone who didn't look like them. This was basically like the purge, if the purge was also racist. Which, it doesn't have to be, like the purge is bad enough as it is. We don't really need to add racism to it, but boy howdy, did they do it anyway. You know. <laughs> The lynch mob was arresting black people and imprisoning them in a ballpark. I remember men taking my father to a place where they kept prisoners at Levant and Elgin, McNulty Park. Other than that, I never saw my father anymore during the race ride. I just remember my mother taking care of us. You know, uh, locking people up and using a baseball park as, as a prison really makes mass incarceration America's favorite pastime, doesn't it? Damn. <laughs> 1,256 houses were burned. 215 houses were looted, and the business district faced irreparable damage. 21 churches, 21 restaurants, 30 mm. grocery stores, two movie theaters, plus a hospital, a bank, a post office, Jeez. library, schools, law offices, and half a dozen private planes, and even the bus system 
was destroyed. Perhaps perhaps the reason why these buses smell so bad is that they're all just covered with the stench of racism. <laughs> that is not a fun smell. <laughs> Look, this is this is basically why we can't have nice things, you know. Because instead of asking if they can be part of something awesome, jealous, propagandized white folks will just tear things apart. There were even reports of airport, airplanes flying over the town, dropping kerosene to spread the fire. And firefighters say that they were threatened by the mob if they tried to put the fire out. They threatened to kill firefighters for trying to do their job. Eventually, the Oklahoma National Guard was called in to stop the riot after roughly 12 hours. Right. Upwards of 6,000 black citizens were arrested by the National Guard. The white citizens were disarmed and sent home, which some people see as a bigger injustice than wrongfully arresting innocent people of color. The Guard ended up putting black citizens in an internment camp and would only release anyone if a white employer could vouch for them. And these released black folks were marked with green tags. Now, the Nazis Jeez. heard about this, and they were like, well, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Boy, yeah. these Americans, they really, they're good. They're good with ideas is what they are. We should really be paying attention stars to what they Stars could be fun. <laughs> stars. Let's do stars, Klaus. <laughs> yeah. 9,000 black Tulsans were left homeless after this event, and no one is actually certain about how many people were killed in this massacre committed by, enraged, uh, by an enraged white lynch mob. But there were many bodies buried in a mass grave or thrown down a coal mine. Now, this coal mine eventually became a Sears parking lot, which really explains the fate of Sears. Just in case anybody knows, I'm pretty sure Sears is shut down. Like, it's not a thing anymore. God. <laughs> After this event, um, the Tulsa Tribune ran the story in the front page, and a lot of white Tulsans were selling postcards of the destruction because capitalism gives zero fucks about anything except profits. Right. Mm -hmm. The New York Times... And Tulsa World also ran stories, but public opinion of this event was not as celebratory as one would expect. Because even in 1921, lynch mobs and racial violence, very unpopular. Super unpopular. I don't think there's ever been a moment in history where people were like, boy, you know what we need is more lynch mobs. Boy, <laughs> that's what society is really fucking missing. And in fact, the political and business leaders realize what a PR nightmare this is to celebrate a massacre like this. And just to be clear, they were cool with the massacre, just not celebrating it publicly. You know, you do it quietly and privately like God intended. So instead of making a statement to get rid of the Klan or reverse segregation in Tulsa, they hid the story. The Tulsa Tribune deleted the story from their front page. The Tulsa World erased all records of it, and even the proud white lynch mobbers fell completely silent. When in doubt, folks, sweep racial massacres under the very expensive mm -hmm. rug made out of an endangered mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. Look, I don't really care who I offend with this statement, but if you're a capitalist, you're morally bankrupt. That's there's no ifs, ands or buts about it. I mean, for decades, people from the future generations didn't know what happened to Greenwood. No history books wrote about it and schools never really taught uh, taught it. Gee, I, I, I wonder why. Right. You know, in Germany, they don't teach the history of Nazism. In Japan, they don't teach the, the, uh, the rape of Nan King. Le leaping a, 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 a gaping hole for history to just repeat itself despite your quiet shame. And the only reason this story even broke and hit the mainstream was because the mass graves were discovered in 1998. Eventually, a bill is proposed to teach the race massacre in schools, 
But Oklahoma legislators claimed the bill to be bogus because the massacre was already being taught in schools. And I'm sure even one of them said, well, look, we teach kids that slavery is bad. What more do you people want? Ridiculous. Yeah, gaslighting the American populace is like America's greatest pastime. But as of 2004, the race massacre is being taught in Oklahoma schools. They also decided on a $33 million restitution, which is nice, but not nearly enough. Right? Greenwood could have been a model for how to run this country, but because uh, a bunch of rich white people and their exploitative racism, we'll never really know how transformative Greenwood could have been. I would wager to bet that there would have been far less poverty, crime, suffering, and racial hatred if Greenwood would have thrived. The people that committed the Tulsa race massacres would have been the same people that said, well, you know, black people should really just comply with the police at the murder of every innocent black person, right? But these white racists are the ones who blatantly didn't comply with the police and wound up genociding a prosperous black community. And that's because their fear and hatred is far more important than authority. A society ruled by ignorance, greed, and exploitation is doomed to fail. No matter how many unmarked graves you bury the truth in, it'll resurface and show us how we squandered a good thing. Okay, so I know some of you guys are thinking, well, Krish, that Tulsa thing happened like a hundred years ago, okay? Things have changed. Okay, we got a black president, followed by two of the whitest men you could ever imagine. But <laughs> And oldest. <laughs> but, yeah. But we had that one. We had that one. Well, let's not forget that the white dudes uh, are, are responsible for pretty horrific things. In fact, one of them is responsible for setting up institutionalized racism in this country, and the other one just benefited from it. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, we still see this kind of stories in our society today, right? And stories like this are often hidden from the public. We can see that in the way that police brutality videos are hidden from the public. And I'll use a conservative's favorite line when it comes to privacy, right? If you don't have anything to hide, why not just let the public poke around in those body cam footages? It's no big deal, right? It's probably going to show that the cops are innocent, right? It's not like every single fucking body cam image shows that the cops are It can't be every... Is it? Is it every single one? It's every single one. <laughs> Another one of America's hidden human rights violations was in 1985 when the Philadelphia Police Department blew up a neighborhood in West Philly. Now, some of you might know West Philadelphia as the homeland of one Will Smith before he gained his royal status. <laughs> to a lot of other people, it's proof of America's one of America's worst domestic atrocities of all time. This story starts in 1972 when a man named John Africa started the MOVE organization. And that's not an acronym for anything. Their philosophy was simply everything that's alive moves. If it didn't, it'd be dead. It's pretty simple, and I kind of like it. Go great on a t-shirt. <laughs> but MOVE were primarily naturists, right? And the whole, whole family took the last name Africa in honor of John Africa. And they believed in nature's law. They stated that true law is self-explanatory and self-enforcing, which means contracts with them were like a page or so and very easy to read and comprehend, you know? They barely use words like thee or thou or client. Mm. You know? And they don't have any fine print, which the only time fine print is used is if you're an asshole, you know? Only assholes use fine prints, and they're definitely trying to take your firstborn child. That's definitely what they're trying to do. Their point of view of right and wrong was also a bit nuanced, right? They believed that just because something is a law doesn't mean it's right. As they point out on their website, slavery was legal, and so was killing Native Americans. And until recently, it was legal for the police to put their knee on the back of your neck as a way to, quote, subdue you. <laughs> Yeah, we the people realized that that was fucked up pretty damn quick. You know, we didn't need a, a complexly worded document to determine that. 
The move organization would render lawyers obsolete and the film Liar Liar would just become an art piece instead of some people's first R-rated lawyer movie. (laughs) 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 Would just be fun. (laughs) They were also huge environmentalists and believed that all life on this planet is equally important. So they were huge advocates for animal rights. And they were such big animal rights activists that they had several different types of animals at their house. And they also had buckets of raw meat for them, which the neighbors would often complain about. Which, come on, when's the last time you really saw a pack of dogs barbecuing out there, you know? It's been a minute. It's been, yeah, it's been a a minute. You gotta be on the right kind of drugs (laughs) to see that. They were also (laughs) anti-technology. That was very. That was a very specific C point joke. <laughs> <laughs> Move was also anti technology, right? Part of their philosophy was to go back to the hunter gatherer days, but another part of their philosophy was anti corporation and anti capitalist. They believed that technology and science in the hands of capitalism and greed would end up destroying the planet. Boy, I wonder where they got that idea from. So. So to them, the best thing to do was to just get rid of all technology to altogether and move to a much simpler form of life. Move believed in a minimalistic community living and community parenting. Women in Move would give unassisted births and believed in breastfeeding. They also had the entire family raise the kids. I mean, Move really took the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, very seriously, you know? Whereas some people in America believe that parenting uh, is putting on YouTube and then and then letting that kind of parent the child, you know, and yeah, yeah and as we all know by now, uh, YouTube is a sinister bitch. <laughs> YouTube will show your child hardcore porn involving superhero bucks. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. I wish that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> Move also believed that they should uh, they should all be armed, not just for hunting purposes, but also for self defense. In fact, they held political rallies in favor of the Second Amendment, which often offended their neighbors, who then called the cops on them. Look, I've watched large white men enter a Starbucks like it was the end of the Predator movie. Okay. And and people just look at that guy and go, but that's just kooky Carl in his arsenal. But but black folks exercising their rights to the Second Amendment yields an entire army to stop them. This is why racism is objectively dumb. Right. Racists believe that black people to be an inferior race, but fear them for using the same weapons that they do for self-defense. Give these people the gold medal for mental gymnastics at the next Olympics. They did it. They won. Nobody can contort their brain like the racists can. Now, most of their altercations with the police would often turn violent. Go figure, right? And these cops would use water cannons to force their way into their homes. And during these bouts of violence, the move women have reported miscarriages due to attacks from the police. In fact, Life Africa, Janie Africa's child, was killed in one of these incidents. And the police denied the existence of the child altogether. I mean, come on. Give those cops the Grand Dragon Racist Achievement Award right there. You know? Mm -hmm. Big round of applause for for being a vicious racist and a gaslighter of the highest order, you guys. I mean, that takes Mm. some balls, you know? If you're wondering if the Jedi mind trick can be used for evil, <laughs> yeah. don't worry. The Philadelphia police got you covered. Okay, they're, they're all basically Sith Lords that traded in their lightsabers for a gun and a badge. Now, in 1977, the city obtained a warrant to evict the MOVE organization. And they ended up staying in their home for an extra year. And they made a deal with the city <laughs> to turn over their guns if the if members of their organization were let out of prison and the city kept up their end of the bargain but move didn't and in 1978 move was 
forcefully taken out of their homes in a shootout with the Philadelphia police. And this only ended when an officer was shot and killed. Now, everyone thought Move did it, right? But the medical evidence shows that the officer was shot from the back when the members of Move were standing right in front of him. And much like the Kennedy assassination, the official report in the response to the public's questions are, uh, hey, shut the fuck up. Just shut up. Why are you asking questions? Who let you people in here? By 1985, they were in a second house that they reconstructed, and they added additional layers of concrete and other tactics to make their house more bulletproof. What we're going to do is we're going to go into the house next to move. Members of the bomb squad would reach a hole into the basement and onto the second floor of 6223. The purpose was to breach a hole, put a pepper fogger through the wall, leaving the first floor for an avenue of escape for the move people. Um, we breached part of the wall. Officer Miller got the pepper fogger started. And I remember standing next to him when he pushed it through the wall. It had a, about a four-foot pipe. He got it up and he got it running. But he only got it so far in and he hit something else. And the conclusion that we drew at that time, that they had walls inside the walls. We had strategies to help protect us, you know. It's we know how Africa. these people come. We realized that we're... This, is, this was not what we anticipated. They didn't blow three inch holes in the party wall. They blew off the whole front of our house. Look, these precautions were taken because the amount of abuse that they took from the cops, right? They were still doing their loud anti-capitalist rallies and the neighbors complained about profane music. And as I said that sentence, I'm sure there's a Karen somewhere that just clutched her pearls at the thought of this. And at this point, the cops had obtained a warrant for the MOVE organization because of parole violations, contempt of court, illegal firearm possession, and making terroristic threats. I mean, most of the threats were telling people the truth about how toxic the capitalist system actually is. Five hundred police officers descended on the house to serve the warrant and i'm sure somebody thought hey maybe we could just like send one squad car to the house but the commissioner decided eh, it's a fucking tuesday let's get the whole force out there you know we'll make it like a fun racist bonding experience <coughs> and then and then we can all go for ice cream later you know yeah, everybody will have vanilla. That's it. Those are the. That's the only ice cream flavor. No chocolate. Anybody that orders chocolate is fired. <laughs> the cops came over the loudspeaker, uh, loud loudspeaker, yelling, "This is America," and they were right. It was America. A large group of overly armed white thugs ready to murder a group of environmentalists whose biggest crime was a noise violation, and having more meats than Arby's. The Philadelphia police's onslaught on the Africa family started with pumping water through a water cannon into the house. They then pumped 10,000 rounds into the house. And this is where the bulletproofing came in handy. The additional concrete barriers protected the people inside the house. This went on for an hour and a half. And sure, if you're watching Lord of the Rings, they still haven't started their journey yet. But 90 minutes of bullets is absurd no matter how you shake it. <laughs> now, after a few hours, Mayor Wilson Good, uh, who hated the MOVE organization, approved Commissioner Gregor Sambo, uh, Sambor to use an explosive on the house. Using a helicopter, they dropped two C4 bombs on the house. One of them connected with a gas generator on the roof, setting fire to the whole house. Mm -hmm. As the fire raged on, the police commissioner told the fire chief to let it burn mm -hmm. and put it out later. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Commissioner Sambor thought all firemen were also pyrokinetics. <laughs> which is, which is <clears throat> a nerd way of saying they, they can control fire. <laughs> But of course they're not, and the fire burned out of control. 
As members of MOVE would try to come out of the house, the cops would shoot at them, forcing them back into the burning house. Right. Yeah, it's like that game that you play when you're a kid, you know? Would you rather die in a house fire or being shot to death by the racist police? And every time somebody brings up a game like that, I, I always have to ask, <laughs> why the fuck are we playing this game? What, what... <laughs> What is the, why why are that why are those the only options that are available? Like is, is can we can we add a different option? Can we add like <laughs> would would I rather die in a house fire or like pet puppies? Because I would choose I would choose that one is like an easy like can we have like a nice option? This is why I don't get invited to parties very often. <laughs> By the end of all this, eleven people were dead, including John Africa, and five of them were children. 60, 60 houses were completely destroyed and 250 people were left homeless. The only survivors from the Africa family were Ramona and 13-year-old Bertie. Ramona was arrested and incarcerated for seven years for rioting and conspiracy after the cops bombed her house. Mm -hmm. This is like punishing a serial killer's victim's family for not being, quote, careful enough. <laughs> so they go up and be like, look, Mrs. Rodney, okay, if you were a better parent, your son wouldn't have been eaten, okay? Now we're going to let Mr. Dahmer go back to his house and live out his days and, as an upstanding citizen who has taken population control under his supervision. Otherwise, heads are going to roll. <laughs> Otherwise, heads are going to roll. <laughs> this is protocol, you guys. Now, a commission that investigated the incident found the event to be unconscionable and determined that the, the neighborhood wouldn't have been bombed if it were a white neighborhood. But no penalties are awarded to the officials involved in the bombing because in America, racism isn't a crime. It's just a way of life. But, you know, Mayor Good did make a public apology because it was bad PR if he didn't. And I'd like to say that this is where the story ends, but nope. This is the post credit scene to the horrific move bombing incident. Now, the residents of the neighborhood were promised rebuilt homes, and the city chose a cookie-cutter contractor to rebuild the houses on the cheap, which yielded homes to have some problems. And one of the mayors straight up said he doesn't care about what happens to this neighborhood. Finally, Mayor Rendell, we got an agreement with Mayor Rendell to, he was going to fix the major problems with the houses. We, we asked Mayor Rendell, could we have a second opinion about the condition of our properties? And we were able to get uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to come out and do an evaluation. They were built below code, but yet they were certified for occupancy, which implies that they meet all codes and all standards. But they did not. But they told us they did. And then um, Street was elected. <laughs> He was the worst yet. He was, he was, of the four so far, Nutter's running him a close second, but Street was the bottom line animal, okay? What he did, what, what he did was just blatantly said, I'm not doing it. I mean, we got a contract. We got a signed contract from the mayor. And Mayor Street just blatantly said, I'm not going to do it. Now, most of the residents after this left, and the ones that remain, like these folks here, are trying to basically prevent gentrification. Mm -hmm. Because that's what they do. They go to primarily low-income black neighborhoods around the country and create conditions that are unlivable and then force these people out so they can gentrify the space. Look, people need homes, not another fucking shop that sells pottery at an unaffordable price in a fucking mini mall. <coughs> Nobody cares about a, what's that, a anthropology? Who gives a shit? Don't <laughs> fuck your decorative linens. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> 
And look, I'd like to tell you that that's the worst thing about this post credit scene, right? But it is not. After the bombing, it was really, really hard to figure out which bodies belonged to who since most of the bodies were badly mangled. But two of the children, Tree and Delicia Africa's remains, were taken from the crime scene, mishandled during transport, and given to Penn State and Princeton for academic purposes. The parents, who were in prison at the time of the bombing, were not notified and their permission wasn't given. This means two prestigious schools where you either have to be very rich or open to a massive amount of debt to attend use two kids two kids bodies from a war zone for studies and as they learned the anatomy of the human body they didn't learn the anatomy of their racist institutes that thought it was fine to use two black children's bodies for science without the consent of the fucking family and it really shows you how deep racism has permeated into our society that even academia is colored with it. Now, Penn State did make a public apology because, you know, PR, but no apologies were given to the mothers of these children. Princeton, on the other hand, wanted to know what their annual income was before they made an apology because, you know, the poors don't count. Right. Look, you don't have to agree or disagree with MOVE to see what the cops did as a crime against humanity. Right? The worst thing they did was be loud and have meats in their backyard. And if that's awful to you, then don't visit a college dorm room, okay? <laughs> Raw meats smell like roses compared to the smell of sweat, spunk, and missing ramen. It's awful. I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself PTSD flashbacks. <laughs> Look, and, and with this information not addressed or talked about, there's a likelihood it'll repeat. It also shows you why some of these newer civil rights and activist movements are decentralized yet very organized. Because if they were centrally and publicly organized, the cops, the intelligent agencies, and politicians will blow them up like they're the final act of a Rambo movie. And the real question is, knowing all of this, how can people actually trust the justice system in America? Look, America's history is full of these sort of atrocities, right? From the treatment of the Black Panthers, the nonstop McCarthyism, the treatment of the indigenous, oh. Julian Assange, and so much more. It's really, really hard to say that this is a country of good guys. So for them to come out and chastise another country because they don't live up to the American standard is a double standard. And when you call out these atrocities, people just keep telling you that, you know, if you if you hate it here, then why don't you just go back to where you came from? There is no perfect country. And that's not even the point. Look, I call out injustice and inequalities everywhere. Those things aren't exclusive to America. It's a humanity problem. We just have to try to be less cruel to each other. And we have to learn how to detect manipulation when we see it. The reality is I live here in America, which means this is the country I physically see citizens in pain. And this is where I know I can try and make a more just and equal world. And this is why sharing stories like this are important. And these stories are why America can't claim that they're the bastions of human rights. The end. Damn straight. We go, Chris. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And you that go. has been your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure that you hit that like button and hit that share button. Get the word out uh, on YouTube and Facebook. This kind of content is pretty often suppressed and sometimes even gets deleted from their site. So it's very important that uh, you guys hit the like and the shares. That always helps us uh, find new viewers on the algorithm. And if you're trying to subvert censorship, the best place to do that is Rockfin. Uh, Rockfin is the blockchain cryptocurrency video platform site that is all about helping content creators earn an income from what they create. 
and there's absolutely no censorship on that platform. So if you want to follow me on Rockfin, you can follow me at uh, rockfin.com slash krishmohan. Ha ha. And if you want much more content, uh, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, you can find all of my stand-up comedy albums there. You can find past episodes of this show. Uh, if you missed a live stream, they're up on the website there. You can catch past episodes of my interview podcast, Taboo Table Talk. And you can make a donation. If, you would, if you're on stable financial ground and you want to help support the show financially, you can do so directly on my website by making either a one-time donation, which acts as uh, you know, some super chats, uh, as it were, or you can become a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets to the virtual and when live comedy comes back, live comedy shows, as well as additional bonus content, which includes stand-up comedy shows. Uh, and you can ask me questions uh, and and leave comments for me uh, um, as a sustaining member as well. So once again, you can go do that over at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H. M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Thank you very much for tuning in, and there will be a new episode next week, so stay tuned.